First uh, Timothy chapter 6, verses 3, the word of God reads, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but do doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, but such but from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. This is the word of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you would just be with this message today as we look into the, uh, as we dive into this passage, into Paul's warning to Timothy about the danger of greed. And Lord, I pray that as we dive into this topic about money, that we would understand that it is not money that's evil, but the love of money that is evil. And I pray that our focus wouldn't be that we would try to uh, seek that uh, desire uh, just to be wealthy, but that we would be content with what you have provided each and every one of us, even if it's just food and clothing, Lord. I pray that in everything, Lord, as we follow you, that we would be content. I pray that you would dispute this message, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen me physically and also that you would empower uh, through me the word of God, that you would just speak to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Put aside every distractions, help us to focus on you. Help us to put aside every uh, distractions, even the vote that's taking place, Lord. And I pray that we will focus on you, give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, in 2010, there was a survey conducted where researchers found that there is a rise in happiness when one's income level is slightly higher than the other. However, one interesting result of the same survey found that they have found was after one's income of an annual salary exceeds of 75,000, that level of happiness never increases, no matter how much higher your income is than the other person. The result of this survey shows that there is no increase in the level of happiness experienced by an individual. Oftentimes we hear a phrase that money buys happiness, but this survey shows that it's not always an accurate statement. Unfortunately, there are many today that have fallen into the trap, the snare, and that in order to gain happiness, in order to gain contentment within their lives, they must first seek and desire money. But Paul warned Timothy here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You see, true contentment is not found in any money or of this world. Hope and contentment is not found in financial prosperity, but in a future promise. The promise of eternal life and faith. Timothy was receiving a letter from the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, in the about 60s in the first century, wrote to young Timothy. Timothy was like his young protege. It, Paul was his mentor. Paul assigns Timothy to oversee the leading of the church here in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus in Greece. If you go to modern day Greece, you won't really, you won't be able to find that city, ancient city of Ephesus, as much uh, that remains today. But he was in charge of that coastal city of Ephesus, and he was writing here from Macedonia. And he first uh, met Timothy in his missionary journey. Timothy is first mentioned in Acts chapter six, born to a Jewish mother and a Greek father. Paul is writing here in 1 Timothy uh, to teach and to equip Timothy as he pastors this church as a very young man. As he finalizes his writing, he tells Timothy not only to teach the church the true doctrine, not only to make sure that the church was not uh, embroiled in legalism, to make sure that the church understood that we are no longer under the law, to make sure that he would be a man that's blameless, he later finishes this chapter, this book here, to tell Timothy to flee after those that teach contrary to the Word of God, that live a lifestyle contrary to the Word of God. 
There are many false teachers here taking place as Timothy was pastoring here in Ephesus. And Paul was trying to warn Timothy, do not fall into the same trap that these false teachers fell into, especially when it comes to finances and money. As we think about within our life, it could apply, Paul's warning to Timothy, could it be applied within our life as well? You see, do we seek prosperity in finances? Do we seek uh, wealth above everything else within our life? Or are we content with what God has given us? Where is it that we are looking for contentment within our lives? I want us to notice here three details we need to examine for godly contentment. Godly contentment. First of all, I want us to notice here the diagnosis of gratification. The diagnosis of gratification. And within that diagnosis, there is a wrong diagnosis. There is a wrong diagnosis. Look in your Bible here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. It says here in verses 3, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdrawal thyself. And so we see a wrong diagnosis of what true gratification here uh, is, what, uh, what godly uh, contentment is. Paul, writing to Timothy in the prior chapter, gives instruction about how Christians ought to honor elders and how slaves ought to honor their masters. He writes here then, after giving much instructions for within the first five chapters, he writes here now, if any man teaches otherwise, he's talking about false preachers out there, he's talking about false teachers, if any man teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those that speak in contrast to the words of our Savior. Paul was warning Timothy, Paul in the beginning of verse 2, he says, these things teach and exhort. All through the six chapters in the beginning, all through the five chapters in 1 Timothy, Paul was giving instruction of how he could be a godly leader as a pastor here in Ephesus. And he's telling Timothy here, all these things I'm teaching you here, whether it's false, making sure that you're rooting out false doctrine, making sure that you're teaching the order in the church, making sure that you are following the qualifications of a pastor, making sure that all these things that you are teaching the church here, teach these things and exhort the brethren. And now he says, if any man teach otherwise, if anyone is a false teacher, to withdraw from them. Ephesus had many false teachers here. If you look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1 here, verses 3 to 4. It says, I, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, where I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister question rather than godly edifying, which is in the faith, so do. And Paul and Timotheus were traveling together throughout their missionary work, sharing the gospel and planting many churches. But here in Ephesus, Paul charges Timothy to stay at Ephesus to preach the word of God, not only to see people get saved, but to also correct false teaching and false doctrine. And throughout Paul's first letter, he writes to Timothy to correct their understanding of the law. The law is meant to show that we are in sin, in needing of a savior. And he wants them, he wants Timothy to teach the people here to correct their understanding of this, to correct their understanding of gender roles in the church, to correct his understanding even the structure of the church here. And then he says here that that is otherwise the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of this I teach you. I want you to continue to teach these things, continue to teach these truths, continue to teach all, teach all the doctrines that I have told you from the Word of God. But if any man teach otherwise, withdraw from them. Anything that is contrary to the words of our, Jesus, of our Lord and Savior, the doctrines that we hold firmly today. Any of whom teaches otherwise is nothing but proud, he says. He says they're conceited. They know absolutely nothing. They know nothing, but they are interested in questions and strifes of word. Those that teach contrary to the word of God are prideful. They know nothing. They're interested in needless debates, questions, and useless arguments. And so Paul is making it clear that these are the attributes of a false teacher. They get into senseless debates about everything. 
They like to question everything. They like to uh, cause mischief and problems here. And these are the type of people that would even have the following attributes. If you look again in chapter 6, uh, down from verses 4 to 5, it says we see many attributes, including envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings, destitute of a truth. But then he says here also in verse 5, supposing that gain is godness, from such withdraw thyself. You see, when he, Paul mentions that gain, he's saying those that, that are seeking an income, a wealth. That gain means to provide a way, a source of income or livelihood. He's saying here, these false teachers believe that a form of godliness is found in gaining money. Financial gain, now they believe they are godly. Because they are financially gaining blessings, financially gaining money, they believe they are blessed. Those that teach contrary to the words of Jesus teach false doctrines so they can achieve wealth and satisfy their greed. We think about many televangelists today all over to perhaps the internet or TV. They always ask for one thing. They ask for your money. They ask for your money. I think about when uh, we were younger, we were young Bible seminary students, and uh, we saw this episode on a TV show of this one TV show host, and I can't recommend it because he's not a great TV show host, uh, but I remember watching it with my seminary buddies, and uh, the topic was televangelists, televangelists, preachers that go on the TV and ask for money. And then basically what he did was he would, he would purposefully send money to these televangelists, and he would get something back in return. And so we decided maybe we as seminary students, we should just try this for fun. I mean, we were that bored. We just wanted to try this and see. And so we sent $1 to one of the uh, preachers that we saw on TV, and we sent it to them, and we got a letter back, and the letter simply says, you know, it's great that you donated this amount. They don't, they don't put the amount they, they put, and then they says, if you give double that amount, you will be blessed this week. And that says, oh, that's awesome. We're all single, so we're looking for a wife. You know, so we were saying, okay, we need, a, we need to double that. So we gave $2. And we sent that over. And then again and again, they would send the, these little illustrations and all that. And uh, obviously, for those that um, would fall into that snare or trap, they would give much money in the future. But a lot of times, that is, that is the misconception many Christians have, even in our country today. That's a misconception many people in the world have. They, they believe that if they are godly, then God will bless them in a sense. That, that, that describes modern Christianity, that it has become self-focused, not savior-focused. What can I gain from wearing this Jesus product, brand? If I act spiritual, what can I gain from that? What can I gain? What, can I, what will happen to me if I read my Bible? What will happen to me if I pray? What will happen to me if I stay faithful to church? We always seek something for ourselves when ultimately God commands us that we ought to just worship Him. Regardless if not, we are blessed or we are not blessed. And so Paul warns them, false teachers that ask for money in replacement of godliness is seen not only in today's society, but also within the first century. From those that have these motivations, Paul tells them to stay away from them, to stay away from these false Creatures. And so we see the wrong diagnosis that wealth is not a sign of godliness, that achieving great wealth is certainly not godliness at all, all the time. And so, so we see the wrong diagnosis. But secondly, I want you to notice here the right diagnosis. The right diagnosis. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, we read here, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And quite simply, the opposite he gives from the right, wrong diagnosis. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. There is no greater wealth, there is nothing greater than just seeking godliness by being content, with contentment. 
There is no prosperity or monetary gain that will ever satisfy us. No matter how much wealth we accumulate, we all know that none of the amount that we accumulate in wealth will never satisfy us completely. But when we are content with what God has given us, when we are content, even if it's food or raiment, even if it's just a food or roof over our house, when we're just content with just those blessings, then we can have true contentment. It says here, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And Paul tells him, Timothy here, godliness with contentment is great. It's like this, we came to this world with nothing, and likewise, when we leave this world, we are going to leave this world with absolutely nothing. No matter how much we save up in our attic, no matter how much we save up in our suitcase, there is no suitcase that we can have that says, this suitcase is for me, so when I go to heaven, I get to take this up. That suitcase is not gonna come up with us. We all know this. I think about a story of a rich man who had lived a life that was full, but not exactly saintly or Christ-like. He was now on his deathbed, and he summoned his weeping wife. He called up to his wife and says, honey, Go to the bedroom and look under the bed where you will find a suitcase. She did as her husband instructed. And then her husband instructed her to grab the suitcase from under the bed and open it to see what is in it. When the wife opened the suitcase, it was full of cash and treasures and jewelry. The old man says, honey, when I pass away, I'm going to take all that money in that suitcase with me. I want you to put that suitcase up in the attic by the window. I'll get it as I go on my way to heaven. His wife followed his instructions exactly to the T. A few days later, the old rich man died. After the funeral, his wife, after dealing with her grief, remembered the suitcase and what her husband instructed her to do. She goes up to the attic and still finds the suitcase filled with cash and treasures. And the wife replied, I knew I should have put that suitcase in the basement. <laughs> but the reality is, we're not going to take anything after we pass away from this world. When we come into this world, we come with absolutely nothing. And when we pass away, we will not take anything with us. It's like Job, who recounted as he was going through much trial within his life, Job wrote in Job 1.20, it says, Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And the Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was going through so much difficulties. He lost his own children. He lost all his wealth. He lost all his service. He lost every single thing that he possessed. He lost it all. He lost all of it. And he rose up, he tore off his robe, he shaved all his entire shaved off his entire head, and he was mourning the difficulties that he was facing, but he still recognized the Lord and gave thanks to him and says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because in the midst of all that he was facing, he recognized that he came to this world naked and he will exit this world naked. He's not going to be content with all of the worldly possessions, all of the material gains that he possessed. He could have lost all of that, but still, despite losing all that, he still gave thanks and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job was tremendously blessed by that. It is a stark reminder to each and every one of us today that we were born with nothing. We will pass away with nothing. And that was what Paul was trying to tell Timothy, to avoid all this false teaching, to avoid these prosperity preachers, to avoid this false gospel, to avoid this grief, because all of it is nothing. We're not going to take it home. We're not going to take it back into heaven. We're not going to bring any of it. When you were born, you didn't come uh, born into this world with a jacket full of cash. You didn't come like that. That's not, that's not how birth works. And likewise, we would not go pass away with anything within our possession. Paul's word and illustration echoes the word of our Savior. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon the earth, 
where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus is not saying saving up or investments is wrong. That's not the that's not the purpose of his message here. He's not saying saving money is wrong. He's not saying money is wrong at all. What he's simply saying is those that are busy hoarding money, those that are busy with greed within their hearts, to lay up their treasures for themselves, there is no point in doing so. Because all of what we have here today, materials, all of which will be corrupted by moth and rust. In that ancient period of time, people would store food as a, as, as, a modern, as a currency. They would store grain inside their storage, and if you had a lot of grain, especially in the Eastern culture, you would be a wealthy individual. But the problem with grain, when you store it up for a long period of time, it gets eaten by what? Rats, by wild animals, and all of which, even though that is a currency, all of which that is a sign of wealth, all of that will eventually go away. All of it does not stay forever. And then Paul says, all of this is nothing. But then he says in verse, uh, he says, he says in, the, in the following verse, uh, in verse 8, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Food and raiment, the most basic needs of every human. Raiment, clothing. You know, my dad, a couple of years ago, got me this backpack here. He got me this cute little backpack, and you're probably wondering, what is this? Is this my school backpack for school? No, that's not. Uh, but this backpack is what he calls an emergency backpack. There was a large earthquake in Los Angeles, and so he got me this backpack as a reaction. Uh, so he got this backpack, and inside this backpack is a Nintendo DS. No, no it's not a Nintendo DS. But inside this backpack, there's water, I think. There's, there's food, there's rations, and there's things that basic needs every human needs. Because at the end of the day, when there's a large earthquake and we have nothing else to carry, the first thing I'm gonna carry is this backpack. I'm not gonna carry my MacBook when there's an earthquake and I'm about to die. You know, that's not what I'm going to do. Because in the end of the day, if we just have food and raiment, we can be satisfied with that. Food and raiment, how can we be content through Christ, through the gospel, pursuing after Christ alone, reminding ourselves that the greatest gain that we have in our life is not a material gain, but it is in Christ alone. It is what Paul describes as contentment. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. I want you to turn your Bibles there to Philippians chapter 4. And then we'll read that uh, final part in that Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. The word of God reads here, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and, in no, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul was writing to the Philippi church here. He thanks them and he shows them appreciation for financially supporting him. Paul was in, was in house, house arrest in Rome as he was writing this letter. He was writing this letter to the Philippi church and he was under house arrest and obviously he was about to face persecution from the Roman captors. And as he was under house arrest, the Philippi church decided to do something nice for him. They decided to give them a care package. They decided to show him appreciation. They decided to give him financial support and prayer for where he was at. The church at Philippi wanted to send him a love offering and I had to give him encouragement and support for his work. They sent an individual by the name of Epaphroditus to deliver this for which he returns with Paul's letter to the church now known as the book of Philippians. He writes these words that he is content not to show off that he needs more. He's not writing to them, he's not writing to them that I need more money, I need more of this. He's not doing that at all. He's simply saying that I am content. 
to display to the Christians of what he has learned in his time of oppression and persecution. He says in verse 13, through Christ which strengtheneth me. You see, that verse is not talking about you being Superman because you have Jesus on your side. It's talking about how through difficulties and oppression within your life, through all the difficulties, that you can still be content. You can still move forward because you have Christ within you. And it is only through Christ that can strengthen you, to give you the ability to move forward, no matter what difficulty and obstacle that you face within your life. And he says, after Epaphroditus delivers this, in verse 19, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Likewise, how his needs were met because God had used the Philippi believers. God will provide according to their needs. Therefore, let us continue to be content and give God the glory and honor. Let us seek God above everything else. Let us not seek just to be wealthy, but let's be, let's be, a, let's be individuals that seek to give God all the glory and honor. Christ will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never, never uh, abandon you. The author of Hebrews wrote this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And he's saying unto the uh, Christians, the Hebrew Christians there, that everything within our life, your brotherly love, let it continue. Be hospitable. And now he says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Don't covet one another. Don't covet a different lifestyle. Don't covet, don't be envious of somebody else or someone else's wealth. Be content with what you have because God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's quoting here the prophet Moses as he's writing to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid. For the Lord thy God he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Moses, in his final days, begins his transition to lead, of his leadership to Joshua. He charges Joshua and the Israelites that although there are difficult days ahead, although the Canaanites are a difficult enemy, although you're still seeking the promised land, although it's maybe a far off and you don't know what's going to happen, although the oppression the persecution, the difficulties may come. He's telling them, be strong and of a good courage because God is going to be with you and he's not going to abandon you. God will be with you, my friend. He will never leave you as long as we seek after him. The difficulties that we face, the oppression that we face within our life, the, all the hardships let us be reminded to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and never forget that he will never abandon us, never forsake us. This morning I noticed a diagnosis of gratification. It is not found, contentment is not found in wealth. It is not found in monetary gain, but it is found in being content with God, what God has already given each and every one of us. But then secondly, not the diagnosis, but I want you to notice here the warning that Paul gives to Timothy, the danger of grief, the danger of grief. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9, if you want to turn back there, it says here, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It begins here by saying, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It's not talking about those that will be rich. You see the word phrase there, will be, is from the Greek word phulomai, which means to desire, to be predetermined intention with motive, and to wish. wish. So really what he's trying to say is not those that will be rich will fall into temptation. What he's saying here is those that desire to be rich will fall into temptation. Being rich is not wrong. Being well off is not wrong. But he's saying here, those that desire this, 
those that have greed within their life will fall into temptation and the snare and a snare. Paul is addressing those that desire to be rich, not those in the process of being wealthy already. There's nothing wrong with being a wealthy individual. We know many Bible characters that were well off. We already know of one, Job. We just looked into him. We think about Abraham. We think about even modern uh, Christian believers that were wealthy, but they still used it for the glory of God. Last Sunday, we heard a story, a testimony of a man by the name of William Borden, a well-off man, yet he used all of it to reach the Muslims in China. And he used all that wealth, and at a young age passed away, but he used his wealth to give glory to God. And he's not talking about the condition of our finances, but our attitude towards finances. And Paul warns Timothy of what happens when one desires to be rich, when one has greed within his heart. He warns Timothy earlier already of the qualifications of a pastor and deacon. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see the qualifications of a bishop. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of a good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor striker, but you look at what it says here next, not greedy, a filthy lucre. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. Not guilty of monetary filthy lucre. And Paul is writing to Timothy, you must be blameless. You must be one that is not greedy of money. You must be uh, somebody that's not greedy to gain all this possession or material goods. And he's saying, you cannot be one, you cannot be, you, if you want to be blameless, you cannot be one that is greedy for filthy lucre. And now he is saying here, once again, that those that desire to be rich, just like the false teachers here that he mentioned, will fall into temptation and a snare. You see, a snare here in this time, in this century, was mostly used, uh, it was a trap that was mostly used to catch birds. It was something to catch birds. And they would fall into the temptation and the snare. Those that would hover around with this desire, with this greed, will eventually fall into this temptation and this trap. And then he also says that they would also fall into many foolish and hurtful lust. Hurtful lust when we are greedy. In 2002, there was an individual by the name of Jack Whitaker. He was a president of a construction company and he was doing well with his business. And he eventually became a multi-millionaire worth $17 million. This guy's net worth was $17 million. In 2002, Jack Whitaker decided to purchase a lottery ticket. He didn't think that his million dollar company was enough, so he decided to purchase a lottery ticket. He spent hundreds of dollars to gain multiple lottery tickets so that he could become more rich. He bought multiple tickets, and the lottery Powerball was extremely high, one of the highest and largest Powerball in lottery history in the United States. This made national news, not only for the amount, but also what happened within this man's life. He won the jackpot, which was worth at the time $314 million. He won a jackpot of $314 million and chose to keep it after taxes. So eventually, after taxes, it was worth about $115 million that he gets to keep in cash. He was even more rich than before. Originally worth $17 million, now he was worth more than $100 million. This was a multi-multi-millionaire. He told the Associated Press, I will be remembered as one lunatic that won the largest lottery ever in American history, and he made a vow that the prize would not change who he is. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Immediately, a week after, he was robbed after visiting a strip club. When they found out how he got robbed, investigators found out that he was bragging inside the club publicly that he was rich, that he was wealthy, and that he had $500,000 in cash in his Lincoln parked outside of, his, of the strip club. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never tell anybody that I have anything in my car. And so after he was bragging about it, somebody slipped drugs into his drink. 
And him and his accomplice went out and broke into the Lincoln and took all that cash. When asked by the investigator, why would you brag about this? He simply said, because I can. I'm so wealthy, I can do whatever I want. He would spend cash over cash over woman and alcohol, cheated on his wife. He loved gambling and even was sued by a casino. He was sued by a casino. Casinos have a lot of money, but he was sued by a casino because he failed to pay one, he failed to pay $1.5 million in losses. His granddaughter would die suddenly at around 17 years old because she attracted bad friends, making bad choices. How? Because she gained a huge amount of money in just a matter of a week. $2,000 a weekly allowance and four cars, four nice cars. His friend, according to the New York Post, said this, what happened to Jack would be humiliating to a normal person, but he felt like he was above it all as a result of financial worth. I think his reflection would be that he was a victim of the lottery. It certainly wrecked his life. And like Paul warned Timothy, greed, filthy lucre, would lead into many foolish and hurtful lost lust. Greed also drowns men in destruction and perdition. I think about the rich young ruler who approaches Jesus and asks him, Master, what good thing should I do? What is a good thing I can do so that I can have eternal life? This rich young ruler asks, how can I obtain eternal life? What can I do? Jesus responds, why do you call me good? There is none good but one that is God. He was reminding the man that man is never good. Mankind is never good. Only God is good. If you want to have eternal life, young rich ruler, you need to keep the commandment of who that is good. Keep God's commandments. The rich young ruler responds, ask which one? Jesus responds, don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Honor your parents. All of these commandments that we see in the Ten Commandments, honor them. The rich young ruler says, I do all of it. Jesus responds here then, If thou will be perfect, go and sell all that you have. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And when the young man heard, the young rich ruler heard this, the Bible says he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possessions. And Jesus responds to his disciples, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. His disciples were amazed by this, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I think about an anonymous quote that says, Money will buy a bed, but not sleep. It can buy books, but not brains. It can buy food, but not appetite. It can buy finery, but not beauty. It can buy a house, but not a home. Medicine, but not health. Luxuries, but not culture. Amusements, but not happiness. Religion, but not salvation. A passport to everywhere money can buy, but heaven. Why? What is it about greed? What is it about the love of money? The Bible says, Paul says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after the root of all evil is sin, the lust of the flesh. It needs to be understood very clearly that money is not evil. Money is not evil at all. The love of money is the root of evil. Greed is the root of evil. Jesus makes it clear that money can become an idol, taking the place of God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, it says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy body shall be full of darkness. You see, when Jesus says, your eye, if it's single, that word single means to be healthy, to be clear, to be perfect. And he's saying, if your eye is perfect, if your eye is healthy, then your entire body, through the light that shines through your eyes, your entire body would have light. It would be good. But if your eye is not but if it's something that's damaged, if it's evil, if, it is, uh, if it's unable to see, then your body will be full of 
darkness. And he continues and says, If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is materials, riches, and money. And what Jesus is making clear is this. You cannot serve God and money both at the same time, one of which you will serve more. And he's telling his disciples here, he's telling all the people that are listening here at the Sermon on the Mount here, he's saying, don't put an idol within your life. Don't put money as an idol within your life because it's going to come above God. It's amazing how many times money is mentioned by our Lord and Savior because he knew the danger of it. He knew when people love, love money, it becomes very dangerous. He goes to the temple. What does he do? He throws the table of what? Because of what's happening. Gambling, money exchanging happening, all of which is happening in the temple. He is upset by that taking place in a place that's supposed to be sacred and religious. We see it over and over how Jesus rebukes those that put money above God, that they cannot serve both God and money. Money itself is not evil. One can be rich and not evil. The Bible never says money is the root of evil. It only says the love of money is evil. And there are certainly wealthy seminaries. Many of our original seminaries today, as we think about even the one in La Mirada called Biola University was started by Lehman Stewart, a wealthy tycoon, a wealthy individual that wanted to train more ministers, more students to become preachers of the word of God. And so money could be used in a great way. But love of money is the root of evil. When I think about root, I can't help but think of the opposite. You see, when one loves money, it, the root of it, the branches of it, becomes evil. A lot of sin, a lot of lust, a lot of destruction comes out of that root. But when one's root is in the Lord, what happens? Fruit comes out. In Luke chapter 6, it says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of the thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. What are we connected to? You see, the root of all evil, which is the love of money, or is it the root of fruit, which is Christ alone? Jesus tells us, born again believers, that we are his branches, that he is the vine. He says in John 15, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except ye abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And brothers and sisters in Christ, as Paul warns Timothy, the danger of greed, the danger of trying to desire to be wealthy, the danger of this, he's saying, don't, don't try to desire that, just be content with what God has given each and every one of you. God will supply all your needs. He says those that fall into this temptation, those that desire will fall into temptation and snare. They'll fall into hurtful lust. They'll fall into destruction and perdition. But then he also says here, they have erred from the faith. They have erred from the faith here. Paul writes to Timothy warns these false teachers, perhaps they started out as good preachers. Perhaps. But they warned of him, he warned of him of the false teachers that were seeking and pursuing after money as a form they believed was godliness. They were prosperity preachers seeking for their own monetary gains. They have erred from their faith. You see, the word erred there, when Paul uses it, he's saying, let us stray, wrong path. When a preacher, when a teacher is focused on money, the desire to be rich, is focused on greed, he's telling him, Timothy, if that happens, they will err from the faith. They will start to teach contrary to the words of God. They were taught to teach things that are not found in the Bible because of their greed. You know, on Instagram, there is this millennial thing, okay? 
It's a millennial thing, okay? Instagram, there's an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. And I'm not, today's message, don't get me wrong, it's not a bashing on preachers all over the country message, okay? I'm just applying, you know, the false teachers that Paul is talking about here. But this individual, he's a strong Christian here. He's so tired of this basic thing. He's tired of, he's, he has one mission here. He's tired of preachers wearing expensive shoes. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. And the purpose why he posts these is not to show off these shoes. But he's trying to warn people, as Paul warned Timothy, that when we are filled, when preachers are focused on money, when preachers are focused on greed, when focus, focus on the desire to be wealthy, they will start to err from the faith. And I'm not going to show you which preachers he posted, but reality is most of the preachers, their doctrine, when they originally started as strong biblical preachers, it has slowly began to err a little bit. It slowly erred. Why? Because I truly believe Paul's warning applies here. That when we desire to be wealthy, when we desire greed, when we desire even strong reputation, recognition from the world, when we desire to be about self instead of about Savior, people will start to err from their faith. Think about one individual. It's quite amazing, though. And sometimes, if I'm not careful, I get a little envious and I have to repent of that. Because some of these preachers own some expensive shoes. I think about one here. This preacher owns a shoe that's $1,099. I look at my shoe, I got it for free. Amen? <laughs> and I think about, I'm not trying to compare myself to them. And please don't get, don't get, me, don't get my heart wrong on this, on this. But what he pointed out was so true. And what I see here in 1 Timothy, it's so applicable. It's when a preacher focuses more on self, rather than just preaching the word of God, rather than just pastoring, rather than just going out of his way to minister to the people, rather than just being obedient to what God has commanded us to do, they will err from the faith. You see, it's why Paul wrote to the Ephesus church, what did he write? He says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with what? The Spirit. Is that verse talking about you not being drunk with alcohol? Okay, maybe there's a context there, but that's not the main point. He's saying don't be drunk with the world's possession, don't be drunk with the worldliness, but be filled with the Spirit. Focus on the Lord. Focus on giving God all the glory and honor. Don't focus on the world's possession. Don't focus on the material needs of this society. Because all of this will get corrupted. All of this will get eaten up. All of this will disappear one day. So Paul warns of him not to do that. And then he says here, those that desire greed, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. I truly believe money does not buy happiness. In fact, many times money buys sorrow. Money brings sorrow. I think about Judas Iscariot. Judas betrays Jesus after making a deal with the chief priest for a mere 30 shekels of silver, 30 pieces of silver. You see, when we think about that, I love how the scripture makes it clear that it's only 30 pieces of uh, silver. And a lot of times when you look throughout the scripture, you find a correlation of what that means. 30 pieces of silver is not a large amount. In fact, it was extremely low. In, in the book of Exodus, it was worth how much one would have to pay a master if the master slave dies from being bored by an ox. That's how much you pay. It's not a significant amount. You pay very little for a slave's death. And so the chief priest, for Judas to betray Jesus, that's how low they thought of Jesus. The chief priest and the religious leaders at the time, they thought Jesus was so low they says, oh, we don't need to give him a large amount. This is not a big heart. This is not a big bounty that we need to get. We just need to give this man who's close with Jesus, we just need to give him 30 pieces of silver. And that's it. That's what, how low we think of this person named Jesus is. But Judas, because of his greed, 
with just a mere 30 pieces, he betrays our Lord and Savior. And after that, he's ridden with guilt for his betrayal. Matthew chapter 27, it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas committed suicide. He was pierced himself with many sorrows. And that's what greed does. That's what happens when we desire something that is not godly. When we desire greed within our hearts, it's not going to gain happiness within our life at all. But when we are content with the fact that God will never leave us, when we are content that everything that we have within our life, whether if it's just food, whether it's raiment, whether it's even within our lives, whatever it is, if we are content with it, we would be joyful, we would have peace within our hearts. And that's a reminder for even our church. I don't know when we will ever get a building. I don't know when we will ever have something nice of a facility. But let us make sure that we don't get occupied with that mindset. Let us make sure that we as a church do not put finances as a priority. Let us make sure that we put our faith a priority. Let us make sure that we go out there, continue to go sowing. Even if we don't have a building, we just continue to go out there. Let us make sure that, yes, we don't have the nicest facility. That's fine. Church is not a building. We're going to gather and worship, and we're going to continue to do so. And let us never make sure, and yes, there must be discernment. Yes, we will take some time to make sure that we'll put a building committee to look at the finances of the church to make sure that we are able to afford a building, and all that will take place. But let's make sure that our main focus is giving God the glory and honor and being content that we even have the ability to worship the Lord here at Vanda Mullen Elementary. And let us make sure that we are thankful for that. And I pray that our church would never put finances above everything else. I pray that we would put God above everything else. I pray that if our church puts finances as an idol, that God would burn this church down. Because our focus needs to be on the Lord. And that's it. Our focus needs to be giving God all the glory and honor. And so we see the danger of greed that Paul gives to Timothy. And now I see here, lastly, the encouragement that he gives. He warns Timothy of the danger of greed, but then he lastly here tells him to have a desire for godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Paul tells Timothy to be the man of God. He was born in a godly family, grandmother Lois, mother Eunice, both great men, women of God. He says to Timothy, flee these things. Flee the lust of the world. He's telling Timothy to run from it as quickly as possible. It's like what Joseph did. Joseph, who was a godly man, in Genesis 39, it says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Joseph was a godly man, and because when he was in the tempta tempted boat for Potiphar's wife, he simply ran away. He fleed as much as possible. He wasn't concerned about anything else. He knew who he was. He knew that God was aware. He knew that he wanted to just give God all the glory. And so when uh, Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce him, he simply ran and fleed as quick as possible. And Paul tells Timothy, likewise, when the world lust attempts to seduce you with their monetary gains, flee from it. Flee from it. Flee from that greed. Flee from that desire to be wealthy. Flee from that and seek after godliness. Seek after the Lord. It's the same statement he repeats in the second letter, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and with them that the call of the Lord of a, out of a pure heart. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we must run from false teaching. We must run from greed. 
We must run far from it as much as possible. We must flee from it as much as possible. Let us make sure that we are focused on the Lord above everything else and that we are content with what God has provided for each and every one of us. Stay away from greed. How do we do this? We walk in the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? What happens when we walk in the Spirit? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the attributes of the flesh. These are what the flesh wants. These are what the flesh desires. He's saying flee from these things. These are things that you should not be uh, avoiding. How do you do it? Walk in the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? It's love. It's joy. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Isn't that sounding familiar to what Timothy, or Paul wrote to Timothy? He says, flee from the flesh, flee from the youthful lust, flee from these things, and what? Follow after righteousness, follow after godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold until eternal life. It's what Peter writes to the believers spread all over Asia Minor. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the daytime, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. We are able to flee. We are able to resist the devil. We are able to resist all temptations when we submit ourselves under God's mighty hand. When we fill ourselves with the Spirit, when we yield ourselves to Him, when we cast all of our cares unto the Lord. Sometimes when we are greedy, and our flesh just greed has that envy, what do we do? We give it to the Lord. God, I have greed in my heart. I repent of this and I give it to you. Help me not to be greedy. Help me to overcome this difficulty. Help me to not be envious. Help me to just understand and be content with what you have given me, Lord. Content. We walk in the Spirit by reading His Word daily. We walk in the Spirit by being in prayer without ceasing. We walk in the Spirit by going soul winning. We walk in the Spirit by loving God and loving others. And he says here, finally, to finish it off, he says, fight the good fight of faith. A boxing term. Keep fighting, Timothy. Lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. Timothy, you're going to have eternal life. You're a believer. You're going to go to heaven. All of this is happening. You may not be the wealthiest individual. So what? You're going to have the greatest wealth. It's called heaven. Be thankful for that. Look forward to that. Look unto that. Don't worry about anything else in this world right now. Just focus on the Lord and focus on the promises of eternal life. Good profession before many witnesses. I finish off with this verse in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also confessed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way and the sin which thought so easy beset us. Let us run with patience this race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Paul writes to the preachers here, false teachers, they fall into the greed. They believe that their wealth, their desire of wealth, is a sign of godliness. This prosperity gospel is a false gospel. He tells them godliness is to be content with what God has given you and to focus on what on the Lord only. Not on any finances, but on the faith. We must focus on that. And the author of Hebrews says, look up to Jesus, 
the author and finisher of faith. He tells them, keep fighting. Fight off the temptation. Fight off it. Resist it. Flee from it. Run from it as much as possible. When you're tempted with greed, run away from it. And look unto Jesus. Because all of which we are going through, we cannot accomplish on our own ability. But it is only through the gospel that we are able to achieve all that. That we are able to be content. That we are able to look unto Jesus. And we must constantly rely on the gospel. It's what encourages the Thessalonians about the deceased brothers and sisters in Christ. Eternal life. We don't need money to be content. We don't. We have an eternal destination. An eternal home that we can remain thankful for and we can look forward to. And Timothy, keep preaching this truth. Keep looking unto this truth. And you will not fall. You will not err from the faith as long as you stay away and realize that the love of money is the root of evil. That you focus not on money, not the desire to be wealthy, but focus on your Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he provided all our needs. This morning, we find this warning of greed to Timothy by the Apostle Paul to seek godliness to find contentment. We will never find contentment in monetary means. Money will never provide that joy. We can only find contentment in godliness to pursue after the Lord. And so pursue after godliness, for there is a great danger in greed. Let's bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord to bless our invitation.